Howdy. So, how many of you use Puppet in your infrastructure? It's a lot of hands. We certainly use it where we are. Um, but how did it get there? Did you run install.rb? Did you perhaps, um, are you running from a source? Did you run it, are you running from git checkout? Or do you install it with apt or yum? Most of our users are running Puppet installed via packages, either packages maintained and created by Puppet Labs or those available in Linux and Unix distributions. Today we're gonna to talk a bit about how Puppet gets from a git commit to the package installed on your systems and how you can do that with your project. We're gonna assume that you know what a package is. We're also gonna tell you a bit about about why you'd want a package, what benefits it gives you, gives your users. We're going to give you a quick list of questions you might need to ask and where, you're gonna, where you wanna begin. Um, we'll tell you some stories about mistakes we made along the way and hope that you can avoid them and, or see them coming. And last, we'll tell you the story of how we ship software using these methods at Puppet Labs. So first up, why bother? Why package it all? Why do we want packages? First, ease adoption. Which one sounds easier to you? Uh, running apt-get install puppet, yum install puppet, or downloading, finding our download section, downloading the tarball from web, our website, untarring it, trying to find the docs on how to actually install it, then finding out you also need to install Factor and Hira. Yum and, Yum and Apt both brought along Ruby, Factor, and Hira for the ride for free. Also, format familiar, familiarity. If you're running Debian, you expect to see a dev package. If you're running a Red, Red Hat system, you expect to see an RPM. If you're on Windows, you expect to see an MSI. On Windows, if you saw a tarball, you probably wouldn't know what to do with it. And why would you? So if we de deliver packages, the users that are on the systems will implicitly trust us more, and they'll see a format that they are recognized and are ready to use. Also, packages have more power. Most packages have the ability to uh, describe dependencies. So before, as I mentioned, with installed RB, if you didn't have Factor and Hira, you would need to install it separately. With packages, that comes along for free. You install Puppet, you get Ruby, you get, open, you get open a cell probably, you get Augeus, you get Factor and Hira, it's all there, it's ready to go. With tarballs, it's probably not. It's easier to deploy. So if you're using Kickstart, you probably want to use a package. I don't think it sounds like much fun to use Kickstart and try and do that untarring and running in cell RB dance. There's a consistent user experience. When you install it on Windows, when you install it on OS X, when you install it on Debian, packages let you create users, add groups, deploy services, configure them if needed. It can be the same on every platform. And it lets you end build tool proliferation. If you want to have Ruby on all your boxes and you don't have packages, you probably need to install it, which means you need make, GCC, autoconf on all those systems. That doesn't, like, we don't want build tools on all our systems. I don't want it on my laptop. I like it on our build servers. That's where we want it, on our build machines. So packages let you bring in Ruby without bringing in all of that cruft. Great, so packages are awesome. Why isn't everyone doing it? Maybe it's expensive. If you're packaging for something like AX or HPUX or Solaris, then the hardware and the software both probably cost a lot. So maybe that's a barrier for you. Learning these new packaging paradigms is hard. Absolutely. Maintenance. When you have a software project and you haven't packaged it yet, all the bugs you've gotten so far are just on the software. Maybe it misbehaves in some certain cases. The minute you start packaging it, then you start receiving bugs on the packaging. Maybe the upgrade didn't go as expected from version one to version two. Maybe the users didn't get created correctly. Those are the new bugs you get. And also, and then, if you're starting to build a different operating system that changes, say you're building it for Fedora. Fedora 19 just shipped with Ruby 2.0. So we needed to update Puppet and Factor and Hira for all the new Ruby 2 paradigms. That's not a free cost, that, co that costs time. Um, so maybe that's, maybe that's not worth it. Maybe, there, and there's no demand maybe. Maybe all your customers are fine using tarballs or Git checkouts. Or maybe you're really lucky. You have this project called, say, Postgres or HTTPD that 
most distros already have packages for. Why would you bother packaging it already if it's already out there like that? So there's some questions you might be asking, and here are the answers. The expense. AX, HPUG, Solaris, those definitely cost a lot for the hardware, but you can start, start small. You can get either used hardware or start with um, Solaris i3, A6. Um, you could also, if you're doing AX and you want RPMs, you could start with a different RPM-based plat platform, like, like CentOS or Fedora. It's free. Um, and learning is hard, but learning is also fun, and after the first packaging paradigm you learn, it gets a lot easier. The second one, the third one, the fourth one, they're all a lot easier. Maintenance. Maintenance absolutely is a cost you need to bear. So if it's not something that you're willing to bear, then packaging probably isn't worth it. But having packages out there a lot like will expand user adoption, so it probably is worth it in the long run, but you need to be aware that you're gonna start seeing bugs against your packaging, and you need to be willing to keep up with that maintenance. No demand. Really? I bet once there are packages out there, there'll be demand. Packages out there and you just start using them, when you st when you, if you don't have updates in a while, users, users will notice and ask you for, more, for new packages. What if it's already being packaged for a distro? Let's take something we know intimately here, uh, Puppet. And say you're on Debian. And say you want Puppet 3.2. Where can you find it? Surely the last Debian release had some recent version of Puppet in it. Wheezy shipped three months ago, has Puppet 2.7 in it still. So if you want Puppet 3.2 or 3.1 or 3.0 and you're on Debian, where do you get it from? Hopefully you get it from our repos. If you have your, packet, if you have your project and you want to get recent features, bug fixes, maintenance out to your users or let them have new versions, you really want to control the process. You want to have your own, your own packages available for that. So going back to demand, this is a brief snapshot on a Saturday morning of the download hits on our, down, on our Aptium and download server. Saturday morning, 9 a.m., who is downloading packages? Not me, but it's still happening. <laughs> if you have packages, there will be demand. People will use them. It keeps going, I promise. All right, so now you know why you want packages. So now what, what's next? Here's 10 or so steps to get you from where we are today to actually having a package out there ready to, ready to use. You can probably have these 10 steps done in under six months. No pressure. First, pick a distro. See which, what distros your user, you, users are using. See which ones they, they really want support for. Pick one and uh, you know, research it, look into it, why is it there? Um, why did it come about? What's the community like? What, what are their, what's their mission? What are the motives? And read the packaging guide if they have one. They're usually pretty handy. Deb, both Deb and RPM both have packages guides. They're out there. Um, find the community. Find mailing lists. They'll be the best resource you have when you try and build packages. When you're reading the docs, look for some of the following answers. Look for where stuff goes in the packages. Look for their file system standards. Look at how they handle services. So if you're on Solaris, you're probably looking at SMF. If you're on Ubuntu, you're probably looking at Upstart. Fedora has systemd. Debian and, and, old, and CentOS have systemd. What are the packaging tools? Most of them have a lower level tool with a higher level tool on top of it. Debian has dpackage topped by apt. Red Hat has RPM topped by yum. Can the packages actually express dependencies? If you're on Solaris, you're probably a little bit out of luck. But if you're not on Solaris, you're, you're probably in better shape. What's the metadata look like? Is it XML? Do you really want to spend your life looking at XML? How does versioning work? Where does versioning go? Can, can, the packaging, can the package manager handle uninstalls? Can it handle upgrades? Does it do it cleanly? Does it do it sanely? Can it recover from, from failure? How does it handle config files? Do they get left behind? Can it do pre-actions, post-actions? So once you have all those answers, Bring up a VM, play around a bit, get, get your feet wet, figure out how that, that OS works, and then take a small, a small pet project like a Hello World and try and package it up. See how it goes, get it going. Or if your distro has source packages, download those, look at, how they, look at the content, see if there's any small improvements to make. make, make improvements, try and rebuild it. See if it still works. Then take your project, the one you actually want to package, and start packaging it. 
Once you have it built, test it, install it, install it in a bunch of places. Install it in places you don't expect it to get installed. And try and install a deb on Windows, because users will, and see what happens. You don't really want to try that. <laughs> but then, once it's done, how do users know that package actually came from you? If, you? if you download our packages, how do you know it came from us? We sign it. We have a GPG key. We sign our packages. We sign our tarballs. So this is a good idea. You make, a GP, you make a GPG key, publish it to key servers, get it out there. Keep the private key around. Keep it safe. Don't let it out of your site. If your package of choice doesn't support inline signatures, then just detach sign it and leave a signature next to it so that you can still verify the package. Great. That's all done. What next? You probably want to get that package to your users, right? So there's a couple options. You could take this road of becoming a distro maintainer. That might be challenging, but also really, really well, really re rewarding. And you'll get a lot of users. Try and get it into Debian. Try and get it into Fedora. Get it into OpenCSW. Open or you could host basic downloads yourself, either on a basic file server S3, or throw up your own repositories. It's not very hard. There's create repo, there's fret, there's freight, there's rep repo. It's very doable. So now, now you know how. But those 10 steps, those 10 steps I just described, there are dragons along the way, and there are snakes, and there is glass, and there are snakes covering glass. So here are some of the parts covering glass that you should try and avoid. Sprawl. It's really easy when you're doing automation work, trying to handle all edge cases, trying to handle all your workflows. Then one day you try and do a software release and you don't recognize the workflow anymore and you try and run the right rate task and you get it wrong. Or you look through the list of 30 rate tasks and can't pick it out. That's, that's probably a sign of sprawl. Um, we definitely were guilty of this. It's something to try and avoid. If it's become more of a hindrance than a help, then you've gone too far. And you should probably try and take a step back and cut things out. Variation in workflows. You should try, if, when building automation, try and be opinionated and a little bit flexible. You might think that a dev and an RPM need really different workflows. If you, when you hammer down at them, they can be pretty much the same workflow. And, you try, and it's much easier to try and get those workflows to be similar now than it will be later. Historically preserved, preserved cruft. When reading those maintainers guides, make sure you're reading the ones that are up to date. If you're out there reading, say, Debian package maintainers guide from 1997, and you aren't packaging for Woody, then you're going to be in for a world of pain when you try and follow it. You might have, might have had this experience where you're trying to find Ruby docs for anything other than 187. Shipping without testing. This is something that's really dangerous. Um, so certain platforms, I mean, packaging, like I said before, is really powerful, right? So if you do it wrong, you can totally trash the main system by mistake. For example, OSX and Solaris have a nice feature that if your packaging path has a symlink in it and your package isn't, doesn't, thinks it should be a directory, no problem. Package will make, the package manager will make that symlink into a directory. The, whatever the symlink pointed out before is still there, don't worry. But if that symlink would say var or Etsy, that system might not be around anymore. Don't do that. Over abstraction. In our workflows, to build a gem, we take, uh, we dynamically build it out of package metadata, metadata we have available. So on the fly, we build up a, a gem spec. And then we build a gem from that. That sounds great, right? The problem with that, say you're a developer. You want to add a simple thing like a gem dependency to a package like Puppet. How do you do it? It might take a seasoned developer five or 10 minutes to figure out where that goes. That's a problem, because we, the idea of the abstraction of the automation is to make development easier, not to actually bring it to a halt or slow it down. So we definitely went too far in that example. And if you find developers needing, to, needing maps and guidance to try and update simple things in packaging, then you may want to take a look at those and see if you can simplify that workflow. So I've talked a bit about the why and the how and the what to avoid. And now Moses is going to take over and tell you how we did a puppet. Thanks, Matt House. Hi, guys. Um, so Matt House just told you to avoid over abstraction. And I'm going to start by telling you to architect for abstraction. Um, <laughs> So in building the work, 
the workflow that House and I have um, built, we came across, uh, we realized something. And I think that you, if you maintain infrastructure, will agree with me. Snowflakes suck. Snowflakes are terrible. Snowflakes in your infrastructure are hard to maintain. They're expensive. They cause you to work around them because they don't conform to your workflows. Avoid snowflakes. How do you do that? One way to prevent snowflakes from showing up in your infrastructure is to architect for, for abstraction. So what does that actually mean? Uh, when you architect for abstraction, uh, the way that we think of it is you layer your automation so that when you change anything at a specific level, you don't have to change the things that surround it. So if we package for Solaris and OSX and we have system tools at the bottom, if you architect for abstraction, you can, say, add a new system in at the bottom, but the layers above that don't have to change. If you have a system that calls all of your packaging and says, make all these things, you can add something at the bottom, but you don't have to change the thing at the top. So how do you do that? One way to start when you're building your base is to choose a cross-platform tool, so an automation tool. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Make. Who knows Make? Have you ever used Make before? Basically everyone in the room. Make is an excellent example. Completely cross-platform. Every platform I know has some rendition of Make. Um, we chose Rake because most of our projects are Ruby projects, and Rake is uh, Ruby Make, right? It's a Make-like automation tool in Ruby. So if you choose a cross-platform tool to start, you can develop your automation, and then when you say expand and add a new platform, like Matt House was talking about, you don't have to change the tooling. You can still use the thing that you were already using. Like, Rake is just built into Ruby. It's a Ruby tool. Well, it's not built, it wasn't originally built in, but it's built in now. And, I mean, we packaged Ruby for AIX, which means we have Rake on AIX. And if you can package Ruby for AIX, you can package Ruby anywhere. Uh, start small by laying an expansion groundwork. Lay the framework for expansion even at the beginning. So you might be packaging your first thing, right? You're packaging your first product. You don't need a giant build farm. You don't need 700 Jenkins build slaves to serve up the infinite hordes of people downloading your first package. But when you're writing the automation initially, you can do things. You can put in little bits in your code so that later on when you do expand, you can use those without rewriting the framework from the start. Some of the things that we found out the hard way include things like don't hard code paths. Work in a workspace. If you're working in a workspace that's like a temporary directory, it turns out other people can also use the automation on the same host at the same time and you won't clobber each other's files. Make your infrastructure assumptions configurable. Our automation has a lot of assumptions built in about the infrastructure that we use at Puppet Labs. We have C names that point to build hosts and Jenkins servers and so on. But in our automation, we drive that with data. We pass in the data at the beginning and say, this is where all that stuff is. Here's the automation that uses that data. That way, when the infrastructure changes out from underneath, we don't have to change the automation. If you're building your first package, odds are in two years, the infrastructure that you're building on now isn't going to look anything like that stuff. In two years, your infrastructure hopefully will be much larger, right? But you don't want to have to change the automation that runs on that infrastructure when it does change. Automation is kind of like a, in, in, in software companies, automation is kind of like a build like ugly stepchild compared to like software development or programming, or it can be. In some places it kind of has that stigma. But you have to treat your automation just like you treat the application that you develop. When you're building the automation and you're, you're defining your, uh, your way that you're going to interact with it, your interface, if I'm going to call this command to execute this build, you have to define an API for it. You want to treat your automation like you treat your applications. By defining an API, you gain all of the things that you would from a well-formed software API. And then later, when you change things, you know what's backwards and compatible. You know what's forwards compatible. 
You know the things that people are using and what they've come to rely on you for. Odds are somebody someday is going to use your automation. It's not just always going to be you. In fact, ideally, it won't always be you. Ideally, it'll be some automation server and you don't have to work anymore. Just joking. So how do we do it? So I'm telling you, we architect for abstraction. We build for a lot of stuff. We build for RHEL derivatives, all the supported versions of RHEL derivatives, Fedora, Debian. We build for Windows, Ruby gems, which goes on everything. We build tarballs. We, you can run from source, but we don't actually have to do anything. But you, we build packages for OS X. So in May, House and I attended the, or Matt House, we, we, I call him House for short. Uh, we attended the first international conference, or first international workshop on release engineering. And we gave a presentation there on our system. And that system looks nothing like the system that we have today. The system that I'm about to tell you about is completely different from the system that we were using in May. Well, that's actually one of the awesome things about working at a place like Puppet Labs, is when you have a huge problem, you can just solve it. So we had a huge problem. So we'd taken abstraction to its natural conclusion. We'd abstracted everything. We'd built a build system that was so abstracted that our packaging jobs knew nothing about themselves. There was no data in the packaging job that knew what it was packaging for, that knew what package it was creating, what platform, where it was. The goal was to create this, this single source of truth, this one thing that we never had to maintain or update or change. It was just going to be this, this godlike packaging job that would build all this stuff. And it actually did. It was really cool. It built everything in parallel. And then all these jobs would start. We would trigger them. But they would gradually finish or fail. And we had no idea when that happened. We didn't know when anything failed. We didn't know when it stopped. We didn't know if it succeeded. But it didn't really matter because we were just building stuff to ship. So we were like, oh, if it doesn't work, we can check in and we can try again and we can fix the problem. But turns out, if you don't know when your packaging job finishes, you can't drop it into something bigger, like a continuous delivery pipeline. Or you can't test your artifacts afterwards. If you want to test your artifacts, you have to know when they're done, right? You have to know that they got created. So we had this problem, and we go to the release engineering workshop, and we're like, hey, look at all this really cool stuff we've done, but we have a huge, huge problem. So we listened to a lot of people, and we were actually helped out a lot by Dustin Mitchell. And you, have you, is anyone, does anyone know Dustin? He's here at the conference. Dustin is awesome. If you ever have a question about Puppet or anything, talk to Dustin. We also heard a lot from the Netflix release engineering team, which was really cool because those guys are doing amazing stuff. So what Netflix, and also what Dustin told us to do is, so Netflix is maintaining the Jenkins job DSL. It's a plugin in Jenkins that allows you to create a job on demand. You define what your job is going to look like, and then you can create it whenever you want. We didn't go that exact route, but we did something like it. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So first, the base layer. This is the core. This is the system that I was telling you about where we layer things. So we start with Rake, which I'll tell you a little bit more about if you're not I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, which calls down to Ruby, which is our wrappers and utility methods, which calls down to our system tools. So things like package add or dpackage, build package, or pbuilder. This is what drives our packaging. This is the core. Whenever we want to add a new system, we change it here and occasionally here. And at the top, we usually don't have to. This is just a quick rake syntax check. This is what rake looks like. It's kind of like make, where you have tasks that you can chain. So see, the top. This hash rocket is the rake DSL. It's this task depends on this task. So we say rake install, and install says, oh, I depend on make. And then make says, oh, I depend on configure. And configure says, oh, I'm just going to run this. So configure runs, then make runs, then install runs. Chaining all these tasks allows us to build a giant infrastructure around our packaging. 
in a relatively clean, sane, Ruby-looking way. And because, I mean, I love Ruby. I'm sure not everyone here loves Ruby, but I think it's great. Um, rake is just a DSL built on top of Ruby. So anything you do in Ruby, you can do in Rake, in a Rake task. In the middle of our layer, we have, like I said, the utilities, but then some all, also some interesting things. So the packaging automation, the reason that we're really proud of our packaging automation is that I think it breaks some, some interesting trends. First, the data about packaging lives in the projects, not in the tools. This is what I was talking about when I said we have a, a data-driven approach, where you don't have to encode the, the data in the tooling, so you don't have to change the tooling when the data changes. So each project has a data file in EXT that defines, or two data files that define how they're packaged. Then the tooling loads those data files and knows how to package the project. The project also has packaging artifacts inside of itself, like um, rules files if you're a Debian packager, or a Red Hat spec file if you're a Red Hat packager. It has all these things. They all live in EXT in every one of our projects. The thing is, is that anything that changes constantly, like say anything with a version in it, is a template. They're all ERB files. ERB is a Ruby templating engine. It's a Ruby templating language. So you can define an ERB file. What it does is it has text in it, but inside of your text you can embed Ruby. And you can say, Ruby, here put this statement, or here put this context, or here put this, this text. So when we build, we define our packaging artifacts at build time. Then those packaging artifacts become what we use to build the package but we don't actually have to do anything manually. We never have to change a version file in something. That was the goal to begin with. We don't want to do the work to package the stuff. We have computers to do that for us. The automation itself lives totally separate from the project. There's no automation in the project that knows how to build the project. It's all in a separate repository that's open source, Puppet Lab slash packaging on GitHub. The automation is project agnostic. It doesn't know anything about the projects. If we set up a project with the data files and the packaging artifacts, the automation will build it for us, which means when we want to add a new project, when we want to start PuppetDB like we did last year, you just add the artifacts. We don't have to write automation around building PuppetDB. It's already there. Briefly, the setup is there's a rake file, which is akin to a make file, inside Puppet. The rake file knows where the packaging stuff is, so it says, I'll download the packaging from here. It drops it into a known location, then the rake file knows, all right, I've got all this automation in a known location in my project, now I can load it. Which means now we can do things like package for Apple. Which means you don't actually need anything in the project itself other than just, here's where the automation is, go get it. Which means the steps to packaging are three rake tasks. All right, so that's cool, right? We've got, we've got automation and it can do stuff. But I'm running on a laptop that's a Mac, and it doesn't have dpackage on it, right? Or I hope, I hope it doesn't have dpackage on it. I could do brew install RPM, but it's going to turn out badly. Ask me how I know. So I need to get hosts with tools on them that I need. How do I do that? It seems like I, ha like I, I have a need to define computers in a certain way. And I need to do it over and over again. It's like I need a configuration tool. Turns out we have one of those. It's called Puppet. And then, how do I get my stuff onto those hosts? Let's say I have, I've got 1,000 build hosts all of a sudden because they've magically been auto-magically created. How do I get there? How do I dump my package on there or my project so that I can build it? So I could SSH out. That's what we used to do. We used to SSH out onto our build hosts and build stuff. But that's not scalable. You can't build 10 packages in five minutes by SSHing out to every single build host. And plus, let's say you have 30 or 50, how do you know which ones do what? So first, how do we make the hosts? We have open source modules that set up hosts to be builders for you. RPM Builder and Deb Builder set up RPM hosts, so Cento, actually it works great on Fedora, that's what we've been using. Um, and Deb Builder sets up Deb hosts to be packagers for us with all of our packaging tools. Just downloads them and installs them and gets it all set up for us. So if you want to build a package of Puppet, all you need to do is apply the class RPM Builder, and then you've got all the automation. That's also open source. And now you can build Puppet and Factor. 
You want to change them and build them and deploy them on your infrastructure? You can. The tools, is, they're all there. So we've got Puppet building our builders. But how do we get to the builders? Or even better, how do we effectively assign jobs to the builders? How do we say, I want to queue 30 builds on um, RPM builder or dead builder? We use Jenkins. Jenkins is, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, an amazing continuous integration server that has all kinds of facilities for task chaining, um, downstream and upstream jobs, triggering jobs. So we were like, okay, we'll just set our builders up to become Jenkins slaves, sweet. Jenkins will do it for us, right? Okay. And then we'll say, all right, if this is a dead builder, we'll assign the label dead to the dead builder. Jenkins can categorize hosts by using a label. So we say, okay, we'll have an RPM builder and a Solaris builder. We'll have an OSX builder. But I don't want to maintain 100 jobs that package 100 things on 100 different hosts, right? I don't want to set up jobs in Jenkins that will build things and then I have to change them when the things change. That's annoying. So we took abstraction to its logical conclusion. Jenkins has an API that allows you to create jobs on demand. This is what I was talking about earlier that I learned from Netflix in the job DSL, or at least the idea, the concept of it. Build a job when you need it, how you need it. No more job maintenance. So what we did is we created a job that was amazing. It was gonna, it's the coolest job we've ever done. It did everything in the ideal way for Factor. Factor was the template. That's our, our inventory tool that Puppet uses. And then we downloaded the configuration from Jenkins, all the XML, the bloody XML. It was disgusting. I hate XML. <laughs> and we turned it into an ERB template too. So now anything that used to be project specific in this configuration file is templated. It's totally dynamically generated. So instead of having a job that's static in the host, we define our job at build time. We say, break, do this thing. The automation defines the configuration for the Jenkins job, posts to the Jenkins server, and then triggers the job once it's been created. And the creation is virtually instantaneous. So now you've got a job configured exactly how you want it, for the package you want it, for the platform you want it, and you just trigger it. And let's say you don't just want to do one platform, you want to do all of them. So we're like, all right, let's make this job a little bigger and badder. So we made a huge matrix job that literally builds everything. And then using the groovy label assignment plugin, first of all, one of the most amazing things about Jenkins, there's like infinite plugins. There are plugins to do anything you could possibly want. And if there aren't, you can write them yourself. And it's really easy. It's just Java. Groovy label assignment plugin allows us to take a capability like, say, tar or, or gem, and then map it to a command that we are going to run to package that thing. So say, rake package tar or package gem. Those are our rake tests to build gems and tarballs. And we have the same thing for debs and so on. And then when we trigger the job, this mapping enables us to say, gem only run on gem builders. Tar only run on tar builders. So then you end up with a job that looks like this, where it's a giant single axis matrix with every build target we have. But look at how we've solved the problem we started with. We can add a downstream project and chain it in. Before, we didn't know when things finished. We didn't know what failed or succeeded. But now we do. Each one of these little green balls is going to be an indication that our, our package completed. We now have a package. And when they're all done, we can trigger the downstream project. But wait, where did the downstream project come from? We templated that in too. So if you have a static downstream job, let's say you have an acceptance test that always runs against your packages, you can just encode that as an environment variable when you're executing your rake task. I can say rake, you know, build all the stuff, downstream job equals acceptance test y. And when we template everything, it encodes that in. So the downstream job already exists, so Jenkins isn't concerned. But now our job is connected to it. So when all of our packages are done, it triggers the downstream job, which could be testing, or in this case, is a repository setup to create internal repositories for the packages we just created. So that's pretty sweet. And that's where we are today. We have on-demand capacity. How do you add capacity? You run Puppet Labs modules that create build hosts for you. 
It's parallelized because all those matrix cells run at the same time on the hosts that they're supposed to run on. We can automatically trigger it by setting up an upstream job. Our jobs are changed into, they're chained into a pipeline on demand. We create a build pipeline on demand whenever we need it. And then it's just torn down automatically when it's done. Finally, the coolest thing is that this is all open source. You guys can see how we did it and hopefully contribute back because odds are some of it's wrong. And you know a lot more about what you know than I do, so you can help us out. <laughs> you can also do it with your infrastructure. The whole goal when we made this stuff was so that it would be adaptable, that you would be able to take it and run it in your infrastructure by twiddling the data input, by setting the, the YAML files to do different, to point at different C names for Jenkins servers and so on. And then it would work for you too. And if you have any questions about how to do that, just, you know, get in touch with me. My Twitter handle's on the next slide. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how we're doing it today. Um, before we wrap up, do we have any questions about anything that Matt House and I have talked about so far? Yeah? So, like on the RPM host, are you using something like Mock to actually build it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we use Mock on RPM, and we actually are using Mock to build SLES now, too. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then on P builder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. So when we configure the build host, that actually, so House wrote those modules. Thank you, House. Um, when we configure the build host, it's configured with the tools. So like the RPM builder, like you can set it up if you, you know, the, the flag is use extra packages or something, and it'll set up mock for you with all of the mocks that come by default with what's in Fedora. Absolutely. Yeah, Mock sets up the entire build route for you, like your pristine shroot environment, sets up, pulls in your dependencies if they're available. You can specify in the mock configs, which are in the builder, in the in the builder module, there's mock configs that are, are defaults, and you can edit those. You can point them at new dependency servers for resolving them. Yeah. And does it take a long time for the mock to set up the new environment? Like, like when you build your RPM, you just Yeah, so I'm sorry, I should have been repeating the question the whole time because the, <laughs> the audience isn't mic'd up. Um, so the question was, does it take a long time to boot up the mock environment? And actually, you know that it kind of does. So mock by default builds in a static build route. And turns out when you want to use the same build host to build like seven different packages at the same time, your mock routes are going to clobber each other. So we set up mock to build in a dynamic build route. It's all completely temporary directories, which means that we're not using a cached build route. So things take a little bit longer when we're building. We sacrificed the ability to parallelize, or I mean we sacrificed that speed for the ability to parallelize. In the end, running like 30 or 40 or 50 packages at the same time was gonna take a lot longer, you know, if we didn't do this. There's a proxy. What? Proxy. Yeah, oh yeah, and internally we do have a proxy to satisfy dependencies. How does Jenkins hook up with Puppet? Um, we have Puppet modules that set up our Jenkins hosts for us. The, uh, the internal automation is not public. Actually, you guys, uh, your QA manager on your Puppet Labs YouTube channel uh, has a great talk on how to use uh, Jenkins to Thank you. So if you look up last year's Puppet Conf talks, you will find out exactly how you do that. <laughs> hey, it's not, it was not in last year's Puppet Conf. They actually did one app at the Puppet headquarters. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, you're, yeah, you're right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is a talk out there. By, so Dominic Miragula is our head of QA at Puppet Labs, and the guy's amazing. He's, he's a wizard. But... Other questions? Yeah. Are, are you fed up with Jenkins yet? Uh, it's, like you, you said, because uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of what you've described, and I've come to the size of job configuration, and every time I 
time I touch shank on the brake. So pulling out the, the, the XML, turning it into an herb, and then you know, presumably populating the engine jobs, like, it, has that been an issue for you, or is it, is it fairly stable? So the question was, am I tired of Jenkins yet? And the answer is I was never not tired of Jenkins. I was tired of Jenkins <laughs> since I started using No, not really. Actually, not really. Jenkins is amazing. Um, the, we have had some problems in terms of Jenkins. So we set up Jenkins silos internally. We have different Jenkins hosts for different like, um, revenue streams within the company. So we have a platform Jenkins host, and we have a Razor Jenkins host, and we have a release and enterprise and so on. And they all are their own distinct environments. The sprawl is a bit much. It's hard to manage the configuration of each one. We're making a push to manage it with Puppet a lot more strictly than we do to lock it down. But in terms of stability, we really haven't had any trouble. The, big, the most trouble we've had is just scaling to meet the amount of packaging we're doing. All right, we just take up a lot of space and a lot of CPU because we build on commit for every project we have. And everything gets stored in local repositories. So all of that building, when you're building Puppet and Factor and Hira and everything else that's a commercial product too at the same time, takes up a lot of space. But we're, for the first time, we're actually we're meeting that demand. Thanks to Scott Schneider is in the audience. He's our resident delivery ops guy. Guy pumps out builders like nobody's business. Have you considered build bots or something, something that's a little more? Absolutely. Build bot is awesome. You can talk to Dustin Mitchell because he maintains it. <laughs> yeah, um, there's you know the cost of switching. Yeah. The uh, the question was where's the on-demand capacity come from, and so the truth is is that on-demand is kind of a loaded term, right? It's not actually load balanced on demand. It's, oh, we notice we need more. We'll make more. So that's where the puppet modules come in and where. You just yell at Scott to get more. Yeah, we access the Scott API <laughs> and it returns builders. So is it ESX? Yeah. Yeah. All, yeah, the virtualization is in ESX. Um, there are, so there's um, the OSX builders. Um, R and ESX, the, the Spark is not. Turns out that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> AIX is not in ESX. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we kind of walked you through the steps you'd take to make your own package if you wanted to package your product. And hopefully we've shown you that you do want to do that. We've showed you some pitfalls to avoid <laughs> how you want to abstract, and kind of how we did it. I hope we've shown you that this is worth it, that this is value added for your customer, and that it's not that hard, and that we've done a lot of the legwork for you already. So when you leave here today, take a look at your automation, your building. If you build a product, take a look at how you ship it. Ask yourself if you could be doing a little more, because I bet you could. Thank you.